And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Mike Rigby, former near-death experience book author and publisher who has had encounters with Christ and more. Mike, thank you for joining me and welcome. Hey, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. So, Mike, did you start having these spiritually transformative experiences before you got into the NDE book publishing world or after? Uh, well, that's a good question. I actually uh, didn't realize it at the time as I was growing up that I, I was hearing voices um, often uh, in my life. Um, in fact, I, I sometimes relate a story uh, when I was about 17 years old. I had an old 54 GMC panel truck, and uh, it, it, w- it was a great vehicle. I loved it, you know, as a, it, for a kid, it was a fun thing. But the steering started to get really stiff in it, and all of a sudden, you know, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't make it uh, work. And so I, I got it got tighter and tighter and tighter. And finally, I was needed to get to work, and I couldn't uh, make this thing work at all. And I went in, and I, I actually knelt down and prayed. I can, it's one of those few times when I really pled with God. I've got to get to work. I need to know what to do with this. And if you know anything about these old vehicles, they have a kingpin that. Um, sits inside the steering and it's surrounded by a bushing and the bushing had spun inside there and so when you put grease into the bushing nothing would happen it just i couldn't even get grease in it and so i i I was there praying and i hear just distinctly this voice say drill out the zerk fitting so i i pulled out the zerk where it was and i drilled through that and into the kingpin i put it back in put grease in it, and it ran perfectly. It, I Within five minutes, it was steering like it was brand new. And I thought, wow, okay, where did that come from? And I and I really didn't know at the time. You know, I was really like, it, it, it had to be some divine intervention, but I'd never had that type of an experience. So I began to learn to listen um, better than I had done in the past. But I was still, I was still really naive and very, uh, what would I say, uh, immature in the in that area. So this, you know, that, that's kind of what got me, uh, or one of the things that I recognized right up front. Um, people need to realize that I grew up in a really, what would I call it, uh, strict uh, religious environment. I was, I was LDS, and I did, I, I lived it by the numbers. I mean, it was. Uh, it was everything to me. And so I went through seminary for four years and uh, I went on a two year mission. I went to England on a mission. Absolutely wonderful experience. Loved, loved it. Um, if a person could ever get an opportunity to go out and just serve God without any, oh, what would I say, uh, boundaries, um, you're going to have you're going to have spiritual experiences. That they just will, they just come as a natural offshoot of what you're doing. and so. I, I did that. I went through that. I I, I had all these different positions. Um, when I came home in the church, I was uh, in a whole bunch of different jobs. Um, I was in, if people that are LDS would understand that uh, when I say I was made a, what they call a high priest when I was 25 years old and put on a high council. So I was like climbing this corporate church ladder. But about um, somewhere in I'm going to say early 90s, I ran across Betty Eady's book, uh, Embraced by the Light, um, that she had written. And I was actually able to call and talk to her on the phone. It was amazing. And just the sweetest gal. Uh, and she told of her near death experience. So I became quite intrigued with uh, NDEs. And I was, I, I had a printing business at the time, and I decided I was going to sell it. A guy wanted to buy it, and he was in the publishing business. And so I I sold it to him. And then in order to make sure I got paid, I went to work for him uh, until he could get me paid off. And so it worked out pretty good. But I met a whole bunch of people in that uh, business that were people who had um, had personal spiritual experiences. And 
And so I was sharing this book, uh, Betty Eadie's with the guy. And he says, oh, I've got a book that's way better than that. And I'm like, really? Give me a break. You know, this is pretty good stuff. And he says, no, no, this book was actually written by a Catholic uh, priest. He was actually a Church of England priest who converted to Catholicism. And this guy's name was Robert Benson, um, Robert Hugh Benson, actually. And the book that he uh, wrote was called Life in the World Unseen. And it's a channel book. He, he actually dies. He gets to the other side. He finds out most of what he'd written as a priest was not accurate. And so he's given permission, as he says it, to come back to this friend of his and dictate what it's like to live in the spirit world. And he goes into all kinds of details. This book was originally done in the late 30s, early 40s. And the guy that I was talking to said, I've got a photocopy of it. I haven't been able to find a, a hard copy. And so I started browsing through this and I immediately went and made a copy of the book. And yeah, I, I found it intriguing, totally intriguing. And it went along with the doctrine that I had been taught as a kid about what the spirit world is really like. And he describes all kinds of things in this book, not from uh, a religious standpoint. He said, in fact, the very first part of this book, he says this, he says, who I am matters little, who I was matters still less. We do not take our earthly prominence with us into the spirit world. It is my spiritual work that is of value now. And that, my good friends, is far below what it could be and what it should be. From reading that book and learning about the spirit world, what information do you still hold on to at this point in your life that you learned from that book? Oh, gosh, right. tons of things. It, it, the, the spirit world is divided into a bunch of levels. Um, from, a, from my religious background, they, they talk about there's a spirit prison or dark area, and then there's a light area. But he goes into much more detail saying, yes, there's dark areas um, where people that are have had struggles in their life and are trying to move themselves forward are in those dark areas for a while, and then they can slowly work their way out of it. Did you say spirit prison? Yes, it's like a spirit prison. It's like, it's like and, until they gain a certain amount of light, they can't move forward. And, and light and love are pretty synonymous. So these are people who have very little love in their life mm. okay, that, that are in those places. Um, and there's a lot of books that are that, that delve into that same thing. There's another one that I believe is in the public domain now. This one is is Life in the World Unseen is in the public domain, and anybody can pull it up online and download it for free. I think a couple of the places would like you to donate to them, but you know it is a free book now. And uh, mm -hmm. when I got it, I was able to actually get the rights to publish in the U.S. Um, back in the '90s. And so I started publishing or getting it ready to publish um, back in about, uh, I think it was in 93, 94. But there's a lot of stuff in there that I still, that it, it, it's very accurate. Um, Can, in you its Can you give us some more? Can you give us some more? A lot of NDE stuff. Can you give us some more examples of the spirit world sure. that you find okay. to be true? Well, he talks about eating fruit. And he says, you'll spill it on you because it's so juicy, like a, a pear or an apple. And he said, and it immediately, you're, when you look down, you're clean. It doesn't, it doesn't stain. It doesn't do any of that. He talks about um, the water, going into water, and what it's like to, to go into the water and to actually feel uh, what that water is. It's almost like it's talking to you. Um, and you can feel the energy of it, and it's a rejuvenating energy. He talks about like um, the edge of the spirit world that he's in, that the place that he's at. And he has his, actually has his own home there um, that he received when he when he got there. And he says, I can go to the upper edge of my spirit world or my my area of the spirit world. And he says, I can feel the realm above me, but I am not ready to go into that realm yet. And and it's almost like it suffocates me to try to go there because my spirit is not in a place where it can do that. It can actually go into that. And so he, there's a lot of things like that throughout the book that he talks about um, what they're like. Eventually, he actually gets uh, permission 
um, to come up to a, upper levels of the spirit world and visit because he wants to communicate this information back to a friend of his on the earth. And the reason he does is because as a priest, he gave out information that he said wasn't really accurate. It was off the mark. And I wanted to clear it up. And, and so he, he talks about the dogmas that almost all religions have. And so you see that in there. And I still believe that there's a lot of that in, mm. in religions out in all, throughout the world right now. It sounds like a fascinating book. Yeah, it, it's very fascinating. And that's why I, I, I started marketing that. Um, and I, saw, I sold thousands of copies of it. Um, if every, anybody comes across one that's published by MAP MAP, and it has flowers on the front of it. It's one that I did, and there's there was four in or three books in a series that he actually did. The first three, there was Life in the World Unseen, more about Life in the World Unseen, and Heaven and Hell, and these are just they were just continuations. There's a lot of overlap in the information in the three books, but but the first one was really the the trigger that had the most information in it for me. So this book was written by a priest who channeled another priest from well, the other side. Well, I don't know if the other guy was another priest. Anthony Borgia shows up as the author, but he's really just a scribe. He's, re he's taking down the information that Borgia gives him. And they knew each other um, in, in real life, you know, in, in mortality, I guess you'd say. And, and Borgia, uh, he actually passed away in about 89 so he lived a long time, and they knew each other. Benson uh, died like in 1914, I think. So there's a big, big span in there, um, mm. and the difference between these two guys. All right. So you got involved with this book and publishing uh -huh. in the, all these metaphysical-type books. Uh -huh. and, and then after doing that, did it change you in some big way spiritually? Uh, well... <laughs> The, the results of publishing it changed me. Um, what happened was uh, I, had a, I had a situation. I, I was getting this book ready to, to market. And I had actually bought some ads on um, our local uh, radio station here. Now, it's, a, it's an LDS-owned radio station. And when you start telling them about a book that talks about the afterlife, it's not that's not so bad, but if it's channeled, that's a whole different thing, you know, because they 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 become very skeptical of it, and they were very skeptical of me and and publishing this. So they said, "Hey, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll let you have ads from midnight till six in the morning, and we'll see if we have any complaints about, you know, the subject matter that you're talking about." I said, "Fine, you know, um, they were cheap. They were they only cost me like ten dollars uh, for a sixty second spot." So I thought, well, you know, I can do that for a while. Let's see how it works. So it wasn't that expensive. So that's what I did. And I was just getting this ready to, uh, to go to market and, and, and publish. And, and so I had books available, but I had not done any marketing at that point. And I put the ads on this KSL and they started playing them um, really early in the morning. Well, about four o'clock in the morning, I uh, I get woken up. It's like somebody grabs my shirt and pulls me to a sitting up position in bed. And I'm like, that's kind of weird. And I hear this voice say, you need to listen to the ad right now. And I'm like, now these are random. These ads come out at random. So it's not like, you know, I knew it at time or something. And I start to sit back down or lay back down into my bed. And all of a sudden, this, the, he grabs a hold of me or who, whoever it was and pulls me to a sitting up position again. And I have no idea who that was, by the way. Um, but I'm, I'm up in this sitting up position and, and I'm going, okay, now, I, now you've got my attention. I'm awake, you know, and, and uh, I start fumbling for this radio that we had sitting by the side of our bed. And my wife wakes up while I'm trying to turn the radio on. Now, there's no lights on the radio. And, and I, I was able to switch it on, but there's no lights. And I start playing with the tuner. She goes, what the heck are you doing? I said, I need to listen to this ad. Now, I helped make the ad. So it's not like I didn't know what it said. Um, but I, I said, I need to listen to the ad right now. And she hadn't heard it. So she goes, oh, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll listen to it. And So anyway, I'm fumbling through it. I come across the radio station the very second that the ad starts. 
with that, my wife is like, oh my, you know, I mean, this is a real coincidence. And so we we listened through this ad. Well, it wasn't any different than what I had heard before. And and so I'm I'm kind of scratching my head, why, why is this going on? And my wife turns to me and she goes, There's somebody in our room. And I go, What? She goes, There's someone here in our room. I can feel them. And I said, no, no. I look over and there. I said, there's three of them. They're standing right over there. And I could see three distinct individuals um, standing basically at the end of our bed. And I'm like, holy moly, what's going on here? Before I could say anything, this guy in the middle, he says, I'm Robert Benson, and I'm here to thank you for your efforts in my behalf. And I'm like, whoa. Wow. And he says, any questions that you have about the spirit world, we're here to answer them right now. And so we just ask all kinds of questions. And the biggest mistake I made was that I didn't write everything down right then at that at that very moment. Um, now, my wife and I are no longer together. Um, we still have a really good relationship, but we're not married. Um, but if you were to talk to her about it. She said, oh, yeah, I was there. I saw, I know, you know, she didn't actually see him. She said, I was the one who felt them. They came. I, they were there. I can tell you that. Uh, but she couldn't hear them. And I'd say, can you hear what they're saying? And she goes, no. And I said, yeah, listen, j- just, just be still, really still and listen, and you'll be able to hear what they're saying. She goes, I can't hear them. And they would talk to me. And they'd, and so she'd say, ask them about this. Ask them about that. So I'd ask them and they'd give me an answer. And I'd say, here's what they said. And so we went back and forth like this for 40 minutes. I mean, it was it was not short. You said you saw them? Yes, I did. Mm-hmm. I did see them. Yes. Did they look yes, I could see. Did they look solid and physical or like transparent no, ghosts? No. No, they, they didn't. I, I wouldn't call them a ghost. Um there I, I felt no fear um in in them being there. It wasn't like I was uncomfortable or you know, any negative energy, none. It was all very positive, um, and, but they weren't. Uh, yeah. As I as I moved down my path, I I recognized later on that they weren't highly evolved yet. You know, I mean, they were doing their thing. Part of the way they grow over there is to be of service, and so they're very happy to come when they get a. And they actually Benson will tell you uh, that he gets permission to come and do certain things. On the earth, and one of his jobs later on is to help people make the transition from the uh, physical life into the spiritual life, and he and he helps take them through the veil that way. Um, he's one that just is there when they arrive to make them feel calm, and and so the, I didn't feel any negativity. Uh, n- yeah, absolutely no negativity all, at all from them. Um, Did in you talking have- with them? Did you ask him about reincarnation and whether we come back or do we just stay there for eternity? Yeah, at that time, I did not ask him about reincarnation, but I found out about it later on. And and you got to understand that my uh, my upbringing was one and done. OK, um, you get you get one shot at this and you're done. And that that just is not true at all. Um, in fact, it's uh, it's really, really far from the truth. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of NDEs that talk about reincarnation and coming back. Um, but the point of all of this is, is that the one, the, the life that's important is the one you're in right now, because it's the subtotal of everything else that you've done. So this is the one that's important. That makes sense. Yeah. So it sounds like that he's trying to evolve himself, but doing it on the other side. You don't have to keep coming back to evolve, or at least he didn't mention it. No, he did not. He did not. Um, and But I, there's a couple of things that he had mentioned. I can't remember exactly what they are right now in, in some of his literature that would kind of indicate that those are possibilities. Um, he will be the first one to admit that he's not in a high level in the spirit world. Um, he was more self-oriented than he was others-oriented, and that really set him back in his in his growth. Did he tell you where he is now? I don't know because this this was thirty years ago. Did he tell you how to advance yourself while you are here? I didn't get as much from him. Um, as like I did from Christ uh, in that area, um, because he wasn't 
what can I say here? He wasn't really uh, polished or uh, astute in that area at that point. Now, maybe he is now. Maybe he's moved way forward. You know, maybe he's gone into another life. I have no idea. But <clears throat> it, he did not say anything that would indicate that to me. All right. Well, let's fast forward into how you met Christ. <laughs> okay. Um, there's... Uh, well, let me let me jump a little bit here. As I, I had these experiences with um, with Robert Benson, and it was just basically a one time thing with him. A few weeks later, I'm driving uh, in my uh, I had a van at the time, and I'm actually heading over to church. One of my um, children were speaking, and so I needed to get back over there. And as I'm driving down the road, I make this turn, and all of a sudden. I have this feeling that my grandfather is there in the seat next to me. I mean, really, really strong. I, it was so strong that I started to cry. And I'm going, Grandpa, I, I know you're there. And I, I, I totally intended to look over and see him, but I saw nothing. He, would, he, he, he did not manifest himself in uh, any type of physical form or even spirit form. or anything. I couldn't see anything, but I could feel his energy, and it was really strong. And I'm like, wow, I don't know how you're making me feel this way. But when I get to the other side, I actually pointed at him saying this. But when I get to the other side, you're going to tell me how you did this because this is incredible and it feels so wonderful. He never said a word. I never heard anything. I just had this feeling of him being there. Well, a few weeks later, um, he comes again and I can feel this feeling again. And, and as I'm feeling it, he starts talking to me and I'm going, Grandpa, he goes, yes, it, it's me. It is me. And, I, and, I, and I'm like, wow. Um, so we started having some conversations. He was always concerned about his, his posterity, his family. In fact, he came to me one time. Um, this, this probably started somewhere in, I would say, February or March. And as he, as he kept coming, he would say, um, Mike, there's problems with uh, your cousin. And he gave me the specific name of the cousin. And he said, um, I need you to contact him. You can be of help to him. And I didn't even think to ask him, well, how can I be of help? You know, I mean, I just, I, I was just saying, oh, okay. Well, I called my cousin um, and his wife answers the phone. And I said, um, how's everything going? Now? I haven't talked to this cousin in like five years. <laughs> so it's, kind of, it's kind of embarrassing to call, you know, and just ask a question. I said, everything all right? You know, and she goes, yeah, yeah, we're doing great. No problem. I said, anything I can help you with? Nope, nope, we're fine. Okay. So she just lets it go. Well, a few weeks later, my grandfather comes again and he says, you need to go contact them. There's a problem in the family and you can be of service. And I'm like, okay. So I tried this again, you know, and I call and, uh, I get, instead of getting a hold of him, and now you gotta remember that cell phones were really limited at this point. They, they weren't real popular yet. And so I call and, and I get his wife and she says, no, no, everything's fine. Uh, okay, so I just let it go. Well, another time my grandfather comes, this time actually, I'm uh, getting into the shower and I have a shower curtain there. And as I start to step into the shower, I look over and he's standing halfway in and halfway out of the shower curtain. And I looked at him and I says, Grandpa, I said, don't you have any respect, you know, for my for where I'm at, what's going on? And he and he looks at me and I see this big smile come over his face and he says, We see everything you do. And I went, Oh my gosh, that's gonna change my life completely. In fact, I'm not telling my wife what you just said, because I know what how it's gonna change everything completely. And anyway, but he was really funny about it. And he said, no, no, they're, they're, you can be of help to your, your cousin. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is ridiculous. You know, because I didn't know what I, what I could do or how to do anything other than call him. So this time, I, I, this is the third time, I give, these, they give them a call. And by the way, this is all leading up to my things with Jesus. Um, so I give them a call, and my cousin... Uh, his his wife answers the phone and I said, um, how are things going? You know, everything okay? And, you know, I'm, I'm really embarrassed. And she goes, she just starts crying. And I'm going, oh my gosh, what's going on? And she said, well, um, you don't know it, but when your cousin and I got uh, married, 
I had three adopted children, um, and they're from different ethnicities. There was a couple that were uh, from uh, Korea, and another one that was, uh, I think, Native American. Anyway, she said um, there's been some issues with them, uh, uh, like there were with my first husband. And today, the Division of Family Services came in and picked the three up, and they're gone. And then she just bawled, you know, and, she, and I says, oh, she goes, so how do you think you can be of help? And I go, I don't know, but I think I know someone who might be able to. And and so I said, I'll get back with you. Well, by this time, I'd learned that if I just thought about my grandfather, he would immediately come. He would be there instantly. It was almost like he knew I was going to think about him before I think. And so he's he's there. And I said, hey, what, what, what do you want me to do here? You know, <laughs> how am I supposed to help these guys? And, and he says, well, um, we've got a couple of things in mind that we want you to do um, in order to help them. And I said, well, they're saying that they need a, an attorney. And, you know, I don't have the money for an attorney. I mean, I've got this little fledgling print uh, quote publishing business that I'm just starting because I left that other guy and I don't have any money to do anything with it. And he goes, well, we'll help you with that. Don't worry about the money. You, you just worry too much about money. And I go, okay, fine. So about a week later, um, my grandfather comes to me and he says, take a, go to your attorney and ask him for a list of attorneys that handle this kind of a case. So I go over to my attorney and I said, Hey, um, are you familiar with this kind of case? And he says, no, but I know several that are. And he gives me a list of about four names. As soon as I pick up the list, the one that it, there's a one on there that's highlighted, it's like it's white. And I know that that's the one I'm supposed to call. I don't even have to look at the others. That's the guy. And so I give this guy a call and he's, uh, he happens to be a, a bishop in the LDS church. I said, well, if anybody can, you know, recognize this problem and help uh, this guy I might be able to so i start talking with him i says uh i've got this problem it's with my cousins here's what it is and he says let me talk to him so they get together they meet um and and then he gets back to me and, and i said don't talk to him about any of the money part of this i know they don't have the money to do anything and he's i said so how much does this cost is this going to cost and he gave me a it was a, the answer that he gave me was kind of interesting i I wasn't familiar with uh, uh, how attorneys work. You know, it's always, he says, well, I charge $100 an hour. Now, you got to remember, this is the 90s, probably 350 now. But back then, it was $100 an hour. And I just gulped, you know, when he said that. I said, $100 an hour? I says, do you do this in a lump sum type of thing? You know, and he says, he laughed because of my language. And he said, yeah, it would cost about $5,000 for me to see this case through from beginning to end. But I think we can get your, your uh, her kids back. And I went, wow, okay. So uh, he says, how do you want to handle the money on this? And I said, I don't know, but I know some of them probably can help me out. So I go back to my grandfather and I'm, and I'm saying, hey, grandpa, what do I do here? And he says, uh, don't worry about it. We'll help you get the money. We're going to have you go down to Las Vegas and we got a way for you to get the money. And I'm like, oh, I don't even like the thought of that. You know, it was like, um, I had never gambled in my entire life, okay? Not, ne not never put a coin in a slot machine. So, you know, that, I mean, this, this is how green I was. So anyway, um, he says, no, no, just uh, get $1,000 of seed money and go down to Vegas and we'll help you get the money. So I'm thinking, okay, well, okay. I'll. He says, just trust us, trust, just trust, okay. So I... I go to my wife and I said, hey, what do you think about this? And she was so supportive. Oh, my gosh. She says, no, just do it. If that's what they're directing you to do. Of course, it was kind of helpful but for the fact that she had been there when these others arrived, uh, had appeared. And I was telling her and sharing with her that my grandfather had been around. So I go down to Las Vegas. Um, and I, uh, I'm i saying, Grandpa, where do you want me to go? And he says, go to Caesar's Palace. And so I said, okay. And so I go over to Caesar's Palace. And I says, what do you want me to do? And he says, go over to the roulette table over there. And I went. Okay, so I go over to the roulette table and I uh, said, what do you want me to do? And he says, here's how you play. And he did, tells me what to, what to do. And so I'm like, okay. So I go back and forth here. Well, about 
45 minutes to an hour goes by and um, I've got $3,000 up. I'm, I'm ahead. 3,000 bucks. And I'm like, hey, this is pretty slick. You know, I like this idea. You know, And, uh, and I, actually, I was a little bit cocky about it, I think. And, uh, and then almost instantly, I lost everything that I had uh, made plus my seed money. So I go back to, I, I'm, I'm, I'm ticked off now. You know, I'm upset. So I go, I go back. I have a Jeep at the time, a uh, Wagoneer, and I get in the back of it to, to sleep. Uh, and then I'm going to head back home. And, and I'm saying, Grandpa, why? Why have you done this? And he said, well, we just had to see if you'd go do it. And I go, what do you mean you just had to see if I'd go do it? And he said, no, no, see, you put too much emphasis on money and you don't trust us. And we just had to see if you would follow what we directed you to do. Oh my gosh. He says, go home and the money will be provided. Okay. Well, I went home and in the next couple of weeks, I had some interviews to do, kind of like I'm doing here with you, where I was marketing the book. And it, and it happened to be one in uh, Philadelphia. They called me on the phone, I did an interview. And that one show sold 300 books, you know, and, and my profit on 300 books was about $3,000. And I'm going, wow, you know, and, and my grandfather, I can hear him say, you just don't trust this. Just trust. It'll all come. It'll all work out just like it's supposed to. So anyway, uh, that's, that's where this all led to was I'd learned to listen to the voice of my grandfather. And one day he comes to me and he says, I've taken you. Well, actually, the way it was, I ask him a question and he, and he, I get an answer. And the answer isn't my grandfather talking. I, I know it's not. And in inside, instinctively, I know who this is. I, this is not, this is Christ speaking. And my grandfather says, yes, he's the one you should be listening to, not me. I've taken you as far as I can take you. And now you need to follow what he directs you to do. And then for the next... Uh, six months of my life, uh, everything that I got from the other side was through Jesus. And it was the most marvelous time. I can't even begin to tell you uh, how wonderful it was. Um, any question that I asked him, he would share the answer with me. This is where I found out about reincarnation, or I found out I'd ask him stuff like, tell me about the Sabbath day. And he said, well, if we can't get you to focus on the light and love, seven days a week, 24 seven, then we'll set aside one day when you will. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> he says to me, what we're trying to do, Mike, is make you, get you to be a full timer, you know, not just part time at this. It's not just a Sunday deal. And I'm like, okay, well, well okay, I get it. Tell me, tell me about, uh, well, uh, when I was asking him about the Sabbath, he, he actually gave me an example. He said, uh, if I if I asked you to go give the sacrament to somebody on a Wednesday, would you do it? And I said, sure, no problem. You know, and he says, okay. If I ask you to go boating on Sunday with your neighbor, would you? And I and I hesitated, you know, because that's not a Sunday activity. You know, you're not supposed to do that kind of thing on Sunday. And I hesitated, and he sees, he said, see, the very fact that you hesitated in your answer says that you're not trusting what you're doing. You're you're living by the letter of the law instead of the spirit of the law and there were dozens of things that happened like that over the next uh five six months where he told me stuff like that i asked him about tithing one day you know because we in lds church you're, you're paying tithing and i said okay i want to know about the law of tithing and he says well do you want 10 percent salvation <laughs> went, what? and he says see if you only put 10 percent in you're only gonna get 10 percent back because you're not you're not a full timer. And I went, wow, that's a that's a lot to swallow right there. Did you only hear his voice, or did you see at him this as point? Well? Yes, I had not seen him at this at this stage. Okay, so I, I I'll get to that down the road here. Well, what did he say um, about reincarnation? He just said that um, that it, it's it's true, but the the time to worry about is right now, not past lives they're all you are the compilation of everything that you have done throughout eons of time let me let me explain it a little different one time he came to me 
and he said to me, he says, look, and I look over and, and there's a deck of cards and there's 52 cards. Now they're not stacked up in a stack, like on a, uh, a table. They're standing up on a, and the backs are all facing me, these cards. And he says, look, and I look over to the left, uh, card number 52, and they go you know, from 52 right down to one on the right. And I look at the left and it's absolutely black. You can hardly even see the card, it's so dark. And they go from that black one in shades of uh, lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter until you get to number one. And it's like an arc welder. I mean, it's like looking in at the sun. And, and so I'm looking at this and he says, Mike, every single organization, every single group, every single person can be, gives off light like these cards based on the amount of love that they have within them and that they gained through their understanding of life and they give it off. And he said, where I and the father are is the card number one. That's, that's our place. That actually is your goal. He said, if you come along and you see an organization and it's giving, and you're in it and it's giving off the light of 22 and you see another organization, we'll call it a church organization, and it's giving off the light of 17. He says, is it going to be to your advantage to go leave this one and go to that one? And I said, well, sure, because you're gaining more light. And he says, exactly. The whole purpose here is to not stop growing and developing the light that emanates from you until you emanate it just like we do. And I said, is it possible to do that? And he said, it is. It absolutely is. He assured me many times, yeah, you can get there. You'll, you'll make it. Just keep pushing. Keep pushing. Don't, don't, don't uh, doubt yourself in all of this, that you have the ability to do it, to learn to love as we love. So I don't know if that helps you out any, you know, in, in how that works, but um, it was about, uh, about five months into this, um, Jesus comes to me and he says, okay, I'm going to turn you over to the one that I called my father when I was on the earth. He, he said, this is the creator of your spirit. Um, now, when he said that, I got the impression that there were lots of them that were on that level, uh, that were on this, what we call the creation level, and, and could create spirits. And he says, he's the one that you should be following now, just like I did when I was on the earth. And I'm like, oh, okay, so do I, what, what happens with you? And he goes, oh, I'm always here. You'll always be able to rely on me if you feel to come back this direction. He said, but we're going to tell you the same thing because we're, we're one. We, we act as one. Your, your goal here is to become one with us as I am one with the Father. It's like he said in John, you know, in, in the scriptures, he says, you know, you become one with me and we'll come and make our abode with you. You know, and I will manifest myself unto you. I mean, he says that right in there. People just don't realize. What does it mean to be to have him manifest? And I and I pondered that for a long time. Well, I had been, uh, oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that probably isn't relative in here that I can share with you. But um, I had been pondering for a long time how I was going to uh, move myself forward. What was I going to do to try and... Uh, be more loving, be more kind, be more gentle, be more meek. My, my kids would tell you, our dad went through a huge transition. He became a really nice guy <laughs> during this period of time. Um, and I always thought I was nice before, but, you know, I was better after that. Um, but during this time when I was working with Jesus, people came to my office and they had these, um, the, these different records. Uh, they, were, they were like um, something somebody had received. Some of them were like ancient records. Some of them were modern. They were, when I say records, um, they were like uh, uh, channeled information that they had personally received, or somebody had received a long time ago, and they had been given it. Given it had been given to them, and there was like eleven or twelve of these. And Jesus said, um, "Before you came here, you agreed to put this into book form and, and to publish it." And I'm just here to let you know that that time has come. And there's a whole bunch of story that goes into all of that, um, finally convincing me that I should do that, because I was pretty, I was pretty reluctant, because I knew where this was headed. 
um, it was that was the catalyst that actually had me thrown out of the church um, because they they called it apostasy and all kinds of things and um, it was it was uh, kind of a tough period to go through but at that time I was working with um, my father in heaven and and he said uh, he he told me a lot of things um, just like Christ had done and and the the interesting part of that is is you know it's like well, why don't you just tell me what the lottery numbers are you know <laughs> they just laugh they go why do you even think that's important that has no no relevance whatsoever to your growth and i go you mean it and he goes yeah it's actually the opposite it takes you downward instead of upward <laughs> and so they would they would you know joke with me a little bit about stuff like that and i and it took me a long time to learn that that stuff although it's necessary here in this life because we have to eat and we have to do those things but it's not the focus. The focus is on others and loving others and loving others without condition, placing no conditions upon your love. That's a hard thing to do. That's a really, really hard thing to do. So are you saying that there are many gods and perhaps our local God created us, but there's other gods out there that create other beings? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I would say that's that's pretty accurate. Um but they all operate on the same level, okay? It's like they all operate as one. It's not, there's there's not just one there. Um, they have so developed themselves in their spiritual progression that that's where they are. And I'm going to say they because it it's it's not a it's not a one thing. It's a it's a multiple thing. Remember Jesus even even at one time he said, "Ye are gods." Well, what does that mean? You know, um, it, it, it is, it, it's, it's a little bit hard as an individual to grasp that at first, because so much of the teaching that we've had all of our lives is not conducive to that, but that's actually how it is. The, the, the whole plan, um, this eternal progression or progressing eternally is based on that and taking you to that spot to become as your father is. Well, you're not the first guest to speak about that. I think I've had two or three others, and I think a couple of them, during their NDE or out-of-body traveling, they went out there or past a level where there are multiple gods. Uh -huh. Yeah, it, it's hard for us to comprehend because it it's... When, when you know... It, Whenever people try to talk about uh, the love of God, if you've noticed almost every NDE that you ever hear, they'll say, I, I can't even describe what the love is like. Um, at, at, at about this time, I had a really, it was actually about the time that I um, was start working with Jesus. I had an experience where I had shared some of, the, of this information that I was getting from people um, with a guy who was this scholastic, I thought he was a, like a genius, you know, some uh, professor of this stuff. And he really came down on me, you know, what are you doing? You, and, and he wanted to know who my church leader was and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And and for the first time in all the time when I was listening to my grandfather and listening to Christ, I, I began to say, you know what, maybe I don't have this right. Maybe I am not listening. And as soon as I thought that thought, it was like there was this black uh umbrella put over the top of me and the light that would normally come directly into that comes into every person would no longer hit me there was no light i was not getting any light and it was the most suffocating feeling i ever felt in my life and it didn't go away and i went in and i prayed and i asked and i said lift this take it away i i can't deal with it and it got so bad at one time that i finally said it was about four o'clock in the morning and I and I had not slept at all. And I said, "Look, I can't I can't live like this anymore. I don't want to even want to be on the planet if this is how I have to live." And and with that, I I had this experience where I was laying in my bed, and yet I'm standing up next to my bed like it's an out of the body experience. And I'm seeing myself there, and a young boy, probably about the age of ten, comes up to me and he grabs a hold of my hand and he says, "Come with me." And so I start following him, and he takes me on this journey through a whole bunch of places. Um, I see a whole bunch of things that are 
kind of strange to me. Um, a lot of dark places. He and people that I knew that kind of carried a lot of darkness. He showed them to me, and he was trying to, and he just led me in all these places. And um, near the end of this, uh, he takes me over and he says, um, "Follow him." And there's a young boy about. I'm going to say this kid's about 15 years old. And as soon as I see this kid, I go, oh, I I, mean, I used to work with kids like your age, you know. Um, I was a varsity scout leader, which is like for the boys that are 14 and 15 years old. And I loved that age because they they couldn't date and they couldn't, uh, they usually couldn't get a job and they couldn't drive. So I had their attention and they didn't want to do scout stuff. They wanted to do adventure, high adventure. And so I'd take them on survival and all kinds of things. Well, I had this, I... Uh, as he, was, as he was telling me this, a, a whole bunch of other boys show up. There's probably 10, 12, maybe 14. And they and they come over and they form a circle around me. And I'm sitting there watching them as they go around me. And they're these guys, I, I noticed that they had this love between them. There was no, none of the boys felt left out. Now, in my group, you know, there was always some kid that felt left out. In this group, there was nothing, none of, none of that. They didn't feel any of that. And I said, I used to work with kids your age. And they said, we know. And I go, what do you mean you know? And he goes, we've been around them when you were working with them. And I'm like, okay, that does, that kind of makes sense. But, you know, I never saw anybody, never knew any of this, you know. And they said, well, it's on the other side. You know, we're, we're doing this work. So I said, okay. Well, they stand around me in a circle. And the one who's kind of the spokesperson, he looks at me and he says, we've come here to show you the love of God. And I said, really? And he said, look up. And I looked up. And as I look up, there's this blue light coming up from straight up above me. And it comes down over me. And it also comes down over all these boys. And it's and it's encompassing them. And as they're looking at it, and I'm looking at it, they're looking at me. I look up and I'm looking at them. And they take their hands and they, they are down at their side and they turn their palms towards me. And as they do that, all the lights that's hitting them is now focused back into me like it was a magnifying glass. And it's all focused back into me. And all of a sudden, I go through this ecstasy that, I mean, uh, there isn't the best physical experience you've ever had that would even come close to this. It was 10,000 times better than that. I could feel every single cell of my body vibrating with this uh, unbelievable um, love and joy. And, and, and to describe it now, now I know what the NDE are saying. When I couldn't even describe it. Yeah, I couldn't describe it. it. It is so fantastic and so enjoyable that you can't really share what it's like. You have to experience it to know it. And I'm going, man, whatever you do, don't stop. Just let me stay here for the rest of eternity, you know, in this space. And the, the kid says, no, we're only here to show you what it's like. You have to learn to draw it to yourself and then send it forth. And I went, wow, okay. And with, the, with that, the light went out, and I pop right back out, out of bed. And I'm going, wow. For about three days, I, I, I didn't need any sleep. Every, every ailment that I'd ever had in my life was healed, was gone. It was uh, corrected, whatever you want to call it. And uh, my whole goal since that time has been to try and maintain that level of love in my life with everyone that I meet. I don't do as good at it as I have in the past, mm -hmm. but it's this, it, that's the goal. That's well, really the goal. Well, how are you doing that? How are um, you feeling that or maintaining that love? Yeah, if you'll if you listen, if you'll if you tune yourself into those that see it from a different point of view, like from a Christ point of view. Um, you know, and, and you ask, help me be of service this day. What can I do to help someone's life? And they'll direct you and guide you into those things that you can actually make a difference in. And that's what this was, that's what this was all about uh, for me, was learning to be able to do that. And and you have to tune yourself into it. It's not something that you that comes really easy and natural. At least it was not for me. I had to learn to look at it and say, Aha, uh -huh. I get what this is. I need to learn to control my thoughts, my thinking process, because as I control my thinking process, I control everything around me, my whole environment. Everything becomes good. 
there doesn't there isn't anything quote bad and you see it all as good it, and that's a that's a tough place to get to but you can get there i i know it cuz i i've seen it and been there so after all these conversations with jesus did you finally meet him or see him in person yes i did I yes i did i've it. two times once once in his glory and then once not in his glory. Well, that's interesting. What do you mean by that? Not in his glory. Um, see, you remember in the in the scriptures where we'll talk about uh, uh, what's something about being aware of strangers for many have entertained angels unawares. Um, there isn't a single person on this planet, I, I promise you, that, that is going to get away with the idea that, uh, well, Jesus, you never came and talked to me. And he'll go, yeah, I was the beggar that asked for some money. And, and you didn't give me any. <laughs> and he'll say, yeah, yeah no, no, yeah, yeah, I didn't have any money. He goes, yeah, you had, you had four quarters in your pocket. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what it's, gonna, that's what it's like. Because they're, they're around constantly. You, you can't uh, outguess them or outmaneuver them in any of this. And so when I, when uh, the, I, I had a situation, it was another one of those, um, I had some questions. This is, this one was kind of embarrassing. I had, uh, I was in, in bed again, where I, all of a sudden I'm there and I can see myself in bed, but I'm standing next to the bed and these two beings come to me. And one of them um, is Christ and he's standing behind. So I know that the one in front is going to do the talking. And as I'm looking at the one in front, I go, man, you don't glow like Jesus does. I'm thinking that in my mind, okay? And all of a sudden, this big smile comes over his face, and I'm like, oh, he hears my thoughts. This is so embarrassing. And I was really embarrassed. I could have crawled underneath the door at that point, you know? I'm like, oh, dear. And then he, and then he says, oh, how wonderful it is to work with man. And I, and, I, and, I, and I knew what he meant. He was saying, you know, we enjoy this. We love watching you grow. We love watching you develop. Because you're changing who you are inside for a better person. Anyway, it was about uh, it's about the same time that I uh, uh, I had not had an experience yet where I'd actually met Christ in the flesh. And my wife and I were driving down the road, and we had been to some. Uh, meeting where i was marketing some books and we got out we went down and um she says i gotta use the bathroom and so we were driving and i can even tell exactly where it was on in salt lake city we were down in in lower part of salt lake and there's a mcdonald's there and i said look look we can get you into that mcdonald's it, it doesn't look busy you know it's good but i'll run you in so i jump by the time i parked the car she jumps out of the car and is headed to the ladies room and so I, I'm like trying to follow behind her and she's in such a hurry that I'm 10 steps behind her. So I just slow down, let her go and keep walking. And as I get right up by the door, all of a sudden there's this guy appears to on my left. And he, and he looks at me and he says, um, do you happen to have some money? And I said, yeah, come on in. I'll give you, I'll buy you a meal. And he says, no, no, I just, they won't let me in there because of how I'm dressed. Um, I just need some money. And I turned to him and I looked at him and he looked me straight in the face. And I said, here, and I just pulled out whatever I had in my wallet. I didn't, I didn't even care. And, and he said, you know me? And I said, yeah, I know you. And he grabbed a hold of my shoulders. Okay. And he pulled me up to, to looking me straight right in the eyes. And he said, you will never forget this moment and neither will I. I love you. I've been with you always. And he pull, put his arms around me, and I cried like a baby. And the same feeling that I had had when I was standing in the blue light suddenly engulfed me completely. And I, and I just started crying. I, and I pulled back from him and looked at him, and, and there were tears in his eyes. And he said, keep going. Just keep going. And he turned and he started to walk away. Well, I, my wife was just coming out of the bathroom and I could see her inside. So I 
open up the door and I they say, hey, hey, come here, you gotta meet this guy. And she comes to the door and we turn around. There's not a single car in the parking lot but mine and the guy's gone. So do you feel like Jesus was testing you at that point? Yeah, testing's probably a, it, the tests are really for ourselves just to learn. Um, they don't judge us in any way, shape or form. Um, I mean, not even close to judging it. We judge ourselves. Well, how did I do on this? You know, um, this round of, we'll call it mortality. You know, um, did I grow? Did I develop? Did I gain? Um, was I more helpful than I was at other times? That's, that's the kind of, quote, test that you end up with. It's not like what you think it is, you know. It's not a pass-fail here. It's all continually growing and developing. And when you, when you actually get to the other side and you stand in their presence, you will emanate the light that you have developed while you have been here. And there's a lot of people who won't even stand in that because they didn't develop anything yet, but they're still working on it. And it goes on and on and on. Do you have any idea when we move on from this level onto something greater? What do you mean? I'm not quite following the question. Any idea of... Let me kind of rephrase it then. Do you have any idea when we don't need to come back here anymore? We've advanced enough. Yeah, I'm going to say number seven or number eight on those cards. Remember the cards, the 52 right. cards? Yeah. Well, but oh, I don't know if we're going to know how bright we are. Maybe you will know <laughs> well, on the, the other side. Point. You know, so I, I'm just saying that when, when you're at that stage, um, I, would, I would call that uh, an ascended stage or uh, LDS people would call it translated stage um, where you no longer are in need of going through this bodily experience. Somewhere in there. Well, how did you meet Jesus in his glory? That time when um, when he was standing behind the other person? That's it. I mean, he, he, he actually was like looking at the ark welder, you know. And he's just, he's not, he's not really giving me any instructions. He's letting this other person in front of me do all the talking. I had a bunch of questions, and, and this was the person who was to answer them. And he came and answered them, but Jesus was there backing him up saying, I'm I'm with him, and here here's here's who you're talking to, and but that's when I met Jesus in His glory, when I saw his, the the light that He emanates, and it, it, it's fantastic. You people just can't even begin to fathom the love that comes from this guy. You know, I had a church leader once tell me every experience you've ever had was from Satan. I said, I'll take his plan. I'll take Satan's plan because all I felt was love. It's glorious. Are you still in contact with Jesus? Anytime I'd like to. And that's just you think of him and he'll come to you? Of course. Yes, that's how it works. Is there any way? Now, you can't do that willy-nilly. You have to have real intent. It can't be for something, you know, frivolous. But if you see a situation, you say, oh, Lord, how can I help this person right now? Tell me what to do. And he'll immediately give you an answer. At least he does for me now. Have you ever had any contact with UFOs? Uh, no, not personally. Um, but they all, there's so many different cultures out there, um, different, what would we call them? Entities, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, incarnations into different, uh, what would I, bodies, you know, there's lots of them. You, you get to a point where, you, um, through all of this, that you actually have no fear of any of that sort of thing, because you know, who's on your side. I have this little statement that I say, when you know where you stand with God, nothing else matters. And, it, and it's really true. None of the rest matters once you learn and know where you stand with God. But there are lots of other entities out there that, to answer that question more blunt and direct, 
Um, how somebody incarnates into that, I, I don't know. But they do exist. It, 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 this is such a, a huge um, system uh, of growth that it, it's really hard to describe it in those kind of terms. I mean, you've got the Robert Bensons and their levels and where they're at and where they're moving forward and even ones below them and ones above them. It's, yeah, it's just huge. Why do you think so many near-death experiencers say that it's more real on the other side than here? <laughs> because they experience something there that um, clarifies the questions that they actually have here. And so it, 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 it really is, this is, this is the illusion. Okay. That's the reality over there. And, and the, the trick in this illusion is to see it as an illusion. It isn't real. All these things that we thought were important, they're not, they're not important. What's important is how we deal with one another. That's what makes the whole game worth worth being a part of, is how we deal with them. And so they look at it, um, once, once they've had the near-death experience, they see that, and that's what they, they strive for. That's what they want. That's the, they're going like, oh, it was so much more real. This isn't real. How many of them come back and say, well, I'm not afraid of death at all anymore? About every one of them. Here's another interesting fact for you. I probably I'll bet I bet I've listened to you know a thousand maybe twelve hundred uh, NDEs and all of them there's not a single one in all of that that says go back and join the Catholic Church or go back and join the Mormon Church there's not a one none zero nil you can't find one because it's not about a religion. It's about spirituality and developing love within yourself to such a degree that you emanate it from everything that you do in every direction that you go. That's, that's the real goal in life. So in general, what advice do you have for us in leading oh. our lives and becoming more spiritual? Oh, that's easy. Go find this Jesus. Go seek him out. Become one with him. Learn to rely on him. He, he, he's begging you to come and, and be a part of what he is, how he lived his life. Go, go see things like The Chosen. Uh, beautiful, beautiful stuff of sharing the life of Christ. And, and that's, that's what I, I tell people all the time. You know, make him your best friend. You'll love it. This guy can't wait to help you out in every single thing that you're doing. So if you want to grow spiritually, go attach yourself to those kind of people. You know, people say, well, gee, I want to make a lot of money. Well, you'd be around people that have money. Well, you want to be, you want to have a lot of light? Seek the ones who have the light already. Follow them. They'll take you there. And Jesus is one of them. And he's, he's basically the main man on this planet. There's lots of others, but he's the main guy. Mike, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Sure. Yeah, I got no problem with that. What's the best way to contact you? Um, you can do it by email if you want. Um, if we email and talk and, and it works out to where it's easier to do it in a text or even directly on the phone, I talk to, I talk to a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people. And, um, yeah, I'm happy with that. No, I'm totally fine with it. That's part of why we're here, is to share with each other. Do you want to give out your email address? Yeah, it's rigby801 at yahoo.com. Well, before we wrap it up, can you leave us with one last positive message? We're all going to make it eventually. This earth is going to go through some changes. We're talking some really big changes. Those that say, oh, we've progressed and we're not going to have to go through. No, what's going to happen is unless you progress to the point where you can walk through those changes and they won't affect you, then they're going to affect you because it's evolving to a new space, a new place. And we can all do it. We can all get there. You just have to have the desire. Seek it out. 
they'll help you in every way they can from the other side. They will never turn you down. When you pray, there's not a single prayer that is not heard and answered. So just keep knocking, keep seeking, keep asking, and you'll get there. Mike, I promise you will. Mike, thank you for your message, and thank you for being my guest. Oh, Jeff, thank you so much. Appreciate it, you know. Really, really great. You're a great guy, great host, and uh, this was really fun. Well, you did fantastic. <laughs> thank you. Thank uh, you. God bless you. Thank you, and God bless you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.